All right, so Joe says, I have a question about subliner. I've seen that it works when you have symmetry and the subs are in the same vertical plane as the array on the Z axis, but what would happen in cases of partial asymmetry, subs in the center, or absolute asymmetry, electronic arc in center and main flown to the sides? So I'm gonna go through both of these, but I'm gonna tell you that the answer in some ways is kind of simple. Um, subliner doesn't know anything about your system design. In fact, the relative absolute method doesn't know anything about system design. All it cares about are distances. And so it's up to us to decide on where the alignment position is and then where we point our laser to get the distances to put into subaligner so that subaligner will give us accurate usable results. Okay. So I have a design over here in Map3D and I put in a gradient array and an arc array. So let's look at this inverted gradient stack first because this is one of the examples that Joe mentioned. What about if subwoofers are in the center? So if we rotate this around and look at it from the front, you'll see that we've pretty much got everything in the same vertical plane here. So now let's look at it from the top. If you don't have a front of house alignment position that you want to use, then one option would be to just draw an isosceles triangle here. And then pretty much anywhere down this line is where you can put your microphone. Okay, let's call this the zero offset line. So I've got my microphone here and now all I need to do is put my measurements into subaligner. All right, so I'll zoom in a little bit here and get my measuring tape, go up here to the center of this array, 15.25 meters. Here I've got, already have my leopard loaded into subaligner, 16 of them, 15.25 meters and I'm using 700 LFC. And today I'm using Compass with Map3D. Here's Compass. So that means I have the opportunity to load the starting points into these outputs. So that's why this says starting point instead of native. So I've got six subs and what is the distance? Microphone, center, 14.62. And Subaligner is going to give us a suggestion, but I'm actually going to use the one of the filter results here. And in Galileo, as well as Compass, we don't have bezel filters, but we do have Butterworth. So I think it's a fair substitute to put a Butterworth in instead of a um, bezel will have a similar amount of phase shift created by a fourth order Butterworth as we would have by a bezel. So let's take a look at that over here in Compass. You can see here on my main outputs, I've already put those filters in. So here we see fourth order Butterworth at 67.2 hertz. And what else do I need to do? Maybe I can zoom in here a little bit. So I need to add 1.93 milliseconds of delay to the sub and a polarity inversion. So let's go back to the overview. Here are my two gradient sub channels, front and rear. And let's see if I link them, then I can just put the, that's the other nice thing about using compass instead of the map 3D processors. Now I can just put in this delay value and you see both channels will be updated at the same time. But now I need a polarity inversion. So I could invert the mains, but I typically try to just stick to inverting the subs. So I'll just flip flop these guys. And I think we should be good to go. I'll just re-enable this group here, mute this and actually mute the right side. Let's just start by measuring the left side. So here we are in the measurement viewer. I've taken a measurement here of the left side, set the delay for the delay locator, and now I'll store this as 
main, left, and I really only have one microphone position at this point, so I'm not going to worry about noting that right now. And then back to compass and let's measure the sub. Okay, maybe we'll zoom in a little bit just on the low end. So let's say I'm looking at a crossover region from about 63 to 125. Right now, that's going to change when I turn both, uh, when I turn the right main on, but let's just take a look at 63 to 125. So 63 to 125, it's looking pretty good. We're definitely within 60 degrees. Okay, so let's just store this sub. And now let's look at main and sub together. Okay, nice summation there. And now let's look at, now let's turn on both sides. And there we go. We see that ripple caused by the right side coming in. But uh, we can also see the envelope of summation happening. And we can take a look here. Let's take a look at a top view uh, just for fun. Let's just look at the sub for a second because it is a nice sight to behold. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> and then if we turn on uh, just main left in the sub, then we'll see that nice uh, example of that zero line that we are going for. Okay. And then of course, if we turn on everything, then we'll see a bunch of peaks and valleys because uh, right and left sides are not isolated from each other. But this is probably um, a good compromise for the situation that we're in. Okay, let's take a look at the arc. So let's clear this out. Let's clear out the changes that we made here. Zero, and then we need to flip that polarity inversion. Okay, so I've got an arc here. This is what a prediction looks like at 80 hertz. I've got all my time set up here in Compass. So when it comes to where to do the alignment, again, if you don't have a front of house position that you want to use, you want an alternative position in this guide that I wrote. Here's the cover. Here's a table of contents. And I have a section called center ground sub vertical plus horizontal asymmetry. And I think this is what Joe is asking about. So if we go down a couple pages, do you see this strategy, which you may have heard of before? And it is in order to find that zero offset line. So let me show you if we look at this from the front, and then if we were to draw a line from the center of here to the center of here, and then we were to bisect that line, and then we were to basically draw from here and, and find head height, that's how we would find the alignment position in terms of width. Another way to do that, which is may, maybe a little bit quicker if it's available to you, in a, so that's a good way to do it in the field because you can almost just eyeball it. It's pretty easy. Um, but in our modeling software here, it might be a little bit easier just to draw some circles. So that's what I've done here. I just drew circles that are both the same size uh, with the center position at the subarray and the center position at our main left array. And then we're going to see that if, if I drew more of these circles, they would all intersect down this line. Okay, and so that's how I decided on where to place the microphone in terms of width. Now in terms of depth, I use the sub align calculator again from Merlin Van Veen. And I just put in all of my parameters and uh, it gave me a depth to choose, a depth for the microphone position. I'm not going to go through that right now. I've talked about it in a previous video, so I will link to that in the description below this video. Okay, so I've got my alignment position and now I just need to take my measurements. 
15.25, exactly the same as before. And one thing I want you to notice here is that I'm using the exact same preset. So part of this is just demonstrating that when I have the same speakers, although the system design is changing, the only thing I'm changing in Subaligner is uh, the amount of speakers and the distances, okay? So we still have 16 Leopard, and they are still the same position because I'm using the same alignment position, uh, same distance. I'm using the same model of subwoofer, but now there's slightly different distance, and I have seven of them. So let's get that distance. 13.28. Okay, and again, I'm using uh, this filter suggestion up here. So now I need a new delay value. 5.82 milliseconds of delay on the sub and a polarity inversion. So let's put that in. So here we are in our sub arc. I have them all linked, which is nice because now I can put that delay value in. They all update and then I'll put the polarity inversion in. So let's double check that we still have our main measured. Predict. Yep. We're all in the same spot. Okay, so let's take a look at the sub. Okay, so again, zooming into the low end a little bit. Again, looking at about, you know, 63 to 125, looking at 63 to 125, I think we look pretty good. Okay, I'll store this. Okay, now looking at main plus sub, just the left side. See the summation, zooming out, and now everything on together. And there we go. Now we see that ripple coming in from the other side. And we can take a look. Let's look at the top view. And it might be fun to just look at the sub. Oh, we looked at that before. Never mind. So let's look at main plus sub. Okay, you can see that, that line coming through there again. And now if everything is on all together. And there's our result at 80 hertz. So one note about the arc, which I may have talked about in other videos, I've definitely talked about in some of my workshops, but the arc, I think, is one of the most difficult things to work with. Um, there's just a lot going on. Uh, if we zoom in here, each of these guys is being delayed back more and more. So that if we were to actually physically move them, you know, uh, they would end up back here and back here and back here. And so they, they are helping widen this coverage and, you know, so instead of the beam narrowing, we're widening it back out again. So what that does is it makes it so that the, uh, you know, the acoustic center of this array is not actually up here, but it's back here somewhere. Because, you know, we're making like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not drawing this very well, but we're making like this arc shape with our delay values. And so if I zoom out and we look at our microphone position, so from the microphone's perspective, it's actually seeing sound originating from somewhere back here. That means that sometimes when you use subliner or use the relative absolute method, you're actually gonna get better values if you point your laser at one of these guys or one of these guys or one of these guys. I have not figured out a formula for how to tell you which one to do. Um, if you don't know and you're in the field, I always just default to pointing my laser at the center here because it's back here somewhere. So I feel like this is a good default, typically works pretty well. But if you have time to, you know, prepare and look at this stuff in your modeling software ahead of time, 
then I would recommend testing them. And so what you can do is do an alignment where you aim your laser here, do an alignment here, do an alignment here and here, and see which one gets you closest to being phase aligned through the entire acoustic crossover region. And then when you get in the field, it should play out the same way. And you know, okay, I know I'm gonna point the laser at this guy and I'll be ready to go. So I hope that's helpful for you. Um, let me know if you have any good ideas for me in terms of alignment, these interesting situations where we have asymmetry and sort of complex designs. Uh, you can put those questions in the comments for this video and I'll see you in the next one.